questions out. Thank you. Um, so I'll just do a brief introduction of Waze for anyone who doesn't know what we've been doing. Uh, for the last five years or so, we've been uh, working to create navigation and real-time traffic application that is all crowdsourced. So taking the millions of GPS traces from around the world and turning that into a way to save people time by showing in real time what's happening where and routing you around them. Um, so we've been working on that for many years. Uh, John was the first investor in Waze, and we wanted to come here today to share some of the things that we've learned. Uh, and in June of last year, we became part of Google. Uh, so I think some of you might be curious about that process. So we'll try to be as open as possible. Okay. So um, I'm happy to be here to talk. First off, to be with Diane anywhere, I'm happy to do. <laughs> but um, even though she said she's going to ask me some hard questions. Uh, I actually, you know, Barcelona is a great city, but it has, it's near and dear to my heart because I actually met the Waze founders in Barcelona uh, February 2008. So to take you back to that period of time, uh, smartphones had just been launched. Uh, we didn't even really call them smartphones. There was a lot of debate about whether the iPhone would really take over the world and whether there'd be smartphones. And it was these three um, characters from Israel who had come up with this this idea for uh, creating maps, using a community to create maps, and that's what I invested in that time. So it's amazing to think about, you know, when you look at this conference, which is, you know, four, you know, four years, it's really just not that long ago that that company went from, you know, three people and a bunch of people in Israel using devices to map the world to, you know, a very significant, a very significant company, even though now it's part of Google. So we're going to use a pretty unique format where um, we're calling it Crossfire, but it's kind of a, a, a fireside chat going both ways. And we told each other to come up with some questions that we've always wanted to ask each other. Uh, so that's what we're going to uh, try to do. <clears throat> All right. So first one, um, you are the first investor in Waze. You meet these three crazy Israelis here in Mobile World Congress. Um, they only had an idea. They didn't have a business plan. They didn't have all of the things that you as a VC tell the companies that they should have uh, to get funding. What the heck made you invest so early? So uh, it's, you know, it's a little trite. Uh, I don't know if, uh, if the other VCs in the audience, hello. Um, if you're early stage, uh, you know, we talk about business plans, but the reality of it is, is you know, that's, that's really the justification to do the initial investment. I think you have to be very, very flexible. So I'm, I'm not one who's that hung up on the actual plan you're giving me, but what I am very focused on is the people and the quality of the people is the most critical thing and that's always a very subjective uh, decision. Uh, the, other, the next is really market. And the way I looked at Waze at the time was that it was an absolute disruption of the cartography industry. So I knew a little bit about maps, and I knew that it was broken, and that the way that you mapped at that time was you actually paid for people to drive cars around in the case of Google, or worse, you know, people walking around, very, very inefficient, tremendous, you know, a, a big data problem before we had a big data buzzword going. Uh, so when I saw that you could actually potentially solve that problem with a device, that was actually the, the bet that I made, and the simple, bet in hindsight that I had to, had to make was that smartphones would become dominant because then GPS would become pro, you know, prevalent and that, that's, you know, that, was, that wasn't that hard of a bet. So that's, that's why I looked, how I looked at it. Can I ask you one more before you, we move on to me? You can ask me as many as you want. Thank you very much. Right. Okay. So um, typically, VCs are mostly a distraction, <laughs> right, beyond the initial investment. Um, they don't really have the stomach for the, the, the downside, right? And you don't actually know that they're a distraction or worse until something starts to look awry, right? Now, you never fell into that trap with us. You were always on our team. You were always in our office and we never for a moment doubted that we were working together, bad times and good. So I wanna ask you a question. The question is, I want you to talk about a Waze board meeting that was bad. A Waze board meeting when things were not going well, and how you navigated that with the other board members and um, us. Wow. You're already going to the heavy stuff already. Yeah. Well, I can't believe you did that to me. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
I, so philosophically, I do believe that um, when you start a company, you know, it's, you're competing against the odds. The world is already efficient against you. And so you have a limited amount of time to do the impossible. And so anything that's a distraction from that, I just throw away. And so um, I try really hard to not let companies kill themselves with internal fighting or in a board reading, trying to make people be constructive. Um, that's not always possible. Uh, I think that when you look at decisions that a founder has to make, that's, I think that's the most critical thing when you're looking at who do you take on as investors. This is not a commercial for myself. It could be, but it's not. <laughs> what I mean is, is that you have to think about as you build your syndicate, are you adding people that are adding value? Right? And that really comes, that's a Silicon Valley kind of attitude because there's more leverage that an entrepreneur has there, but it's coming here too. And so you have to very much think about you're building, you know, you're building something that's bigger and you have to bring on people that have that perspective. If it's just about money, and especially in the early stages of a business, I think, you know, you're setting yourself up for some problems. And so if, if you add people that are, um, you can tell that there's a mismatch during the negotiations of the initial investment. You should probably not take their money. You're better off passing. So I try to, I try to take the longer term view. Um, not ever, not all investors are like that, but I'm really persistent, as you know. But how do you know, right? <laughs> so, so how do you know how someone's going to act in tough times? Because there is no company, not even WhatsApp, probably, that just did this the whole time without something that maybe looked like it was going to be a challenge they had to overcome? You never know. Anybody who says they know is lying. So we're, you know, the, this is a business of uncertainty. It's uncertain for entrepreneurs and it's uncertain, uncertain for investors. And anyone who thinks that they have an absolute, they're kidding themselves. Every great uh, company that I've been involved in, or fortunate enough to be involved in, We've gone through near-death experiences, but it's the near-death near death experiences that make you better. So I don't think you ever know. But you have a belief that you're working towards something. And I, get th I personally got that from great mentors, you know, people that I met over the years when I, was op when I was an entrepreneur before I, I'm still an entrepreneur before I became a VC. You know, you, it's the mission which holds you together. It's that you're working for something greater, which is why, you know, four years from now is, a, I think, a great title for a conference. I think you have to be thinking, what are we going to do in the future? And that, if you're not, the mundane, you can always get tied up in the mundane, but you might as well be working at a, a telco or something. Finance company, a telco, yeah. nice. <laughs> Good. Um, can I ask a question now? Sure, All yeah, right. absolutely, go right ahead. Okay, so this thing that happened with Waze is that there was, um, it was an Israeli technology company, and uh, we always had this debate about go to market, but ultimately we just kind of followed the app adoption. Um, so it proliferated all over the world, but the company really took off when we headed. At, we created a headquarters in Palo Alto. Um, so we had this kind of bizarre fusion of Israeli and Silicon Valley kind of DNA. So that's the setup. So did you ever have any conflicts? <laughs> and if so, how did you resolve conflicts? Wow, that's a good one. Um... Okay, um, I remember the first management retreat in 2009 uh, after I joined Waze that we had. Um, and we would do these every couple of months where we would get the whole executive team together uh, and we would um, have conflict. Uh, and so I had never worked with Israelis before, but I'm a pretty kind of spontaneous, I can roll with it, right? Um, but it was the first time I was ever in a meeting where when there was a conflict, the response was not, that's a good point, let me build on that, that we do in the US. <laughs> the response was banging on the table, yelling at each other with a red face, and I sat there like this, and I couldn't believe what I was watching. The second meeting, I was the first one slapping the table and screaming because I knew that's how I was going to get my point across. Um, so I think in general, um, we did a great thing at Waze, which is that we did embrace conflict. But I'll tell you what happened was at the end of every one of those sessions, we were all pointed in the same direction. There was no way we were going to leave without all agreeing and being pointed in the direction. And I would rather duke it out 
all day long till we came up with a solution than to have some kind of weird passive aggressive people that are not pointed together. And we were very, very good as a team at prioritizing and keeping us focused in that same direction. We thought about everything from where we should go to market to what should be in the product to where we should spend our resources, when we should launch, when we should have lunch. Yeah. yeah. So it was an Israeli culture. Basically. It was very okay. much an Israeli culture. All right. Yeah. So I get another question. Right? Okay, go for it. All right. So um, when you when you look at when you, when you look at sort of your decision to join the company, um, just so you know, uh, Diane has been as, on many times as an entrepreneur many times. Has been the CEO of her own company. Um, so you made a decision to join this company not as the CEO but to join a team. Was that difficult? You know, walk us through the think, the thought process that you would actually be coming from a prior startup where you ran the company to actually working for and with other people. That's a, that's a good one. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so I really like being the CEO. I like being in charge. I like not asking permission. I like all of that. I like just going. I'm a person of action. Um, and I was okay, uh, but I actually wasn't great. Um, at being a CEO uh, at that time. And um, I, let me just tell you the story about how I got hired. Okay, so um, I was tricked by the CEO of Waze, um, which is how I joined the company. Noam, who's the CEO, um, joined Waze, and then they were wondering if they had a future in the US outside of Israel, because at that time, they only had users in Israel. So he came to Silicon Valley, met some people. One of those people uh, were my, was my advisor at the company that I was running. It was called Placial. It was one of the first social mapping companies. Um, Silicon Valley funding, some of the same investors as, as we have at Waze. And uh, that person told Noam, only one person can help you and you'll never get her. So he was talking about me. And Noam is a special forces Israeli commando kind of guy. So what he did was he called me immediately um, and invited me to come to Israel to give a talk. So we spoke for an hour and a half. And I wasn't making a ton of money at my existing startup, but I was completely committed. Um, uh, but so he offered me really good money to go give this talk in Israel. So I land, and the first people I meet are his investors. I thought, hmm, they're really taking this social mapping thing seriously. Uh, and then I met the rest of the team, I gave some feedback, I gave the talk. And I left that trip to Israel having resigned as the CEO of my company and joining Ways. And I remember being in the taxi on the way to the airport thinking, what the hell did I just do? I don't know these people. I don't know what I'm going to do when I get back home. But I was, I was immediately aware that they had taken this idea that I had much further than I was going to take it on my own. They had an engineering team that I had never seen a team execute that well, and I just knew. I knew it was the right step, and at that moment, I didn't care if I were the CEO. I wanted to build something great. That's ultimately why we start companies, and I never looked back. All right. Do I get to keep going? No. Oh, all right. My turn. <clears throat> okay, so um, as a board member, things look different than they do from the inside of the company, even if we're on the same team. So I want to hear from you, what do you think were the key milestones that put us on a path to success? And now just to be clear, I don't feel like we're finished building the company by any means, and I don't think we've reached the success that we hope to have. Um, we still want to keep going. But to the extent that we have had some success, what were the milestones that you thought, ah, this is going well? Um, well... A big part for me was actually being able to navigate um, the United States. And so um, adding, and Noam joined, when Noam joined, he was very determined that you know, we would take the United States as an Israeli commando. And the first thing he did was hire you. So I had a tremendous amount of relief when that happened, to tell you the truth. The next uh, big event where I really thought was tremendous was um, when we hit 10 million downloads. And you know, I can still remember hitting 10 million, and that was such a big number. And the reason we kind of laugh is, and she can't say anything, but I can. So um, you know, we're 10x that now. And but you know, you, there's always these sort of these critical moments in a business, and that's when we really felt like we were, you know, reaching reaching a, an amazing point. And then the last one, which you and I talked about back backstage, um, since we're going to run out of time, I'll jump to it. Um, the last one was when I really saw that we we're going to make it in America the way you make it in America, 
we were on TV. <laughs> so, you know, you're not, it's not real till it's on TV in the US. And um, there was this event called Carmageddon, which I'll let you explain. But when Car Carmageddon happened, I think that's when it was real, when I could actually forward a link and show people that, yes, we were so credible that the news would actually use us. Do you want to explain Carmageddon? Sure, sure. All right, so, so far, though, you talked about the importance of building the right team as yeah. giving you the confidence and traction. And not just your first traction, but, okay, say our first 10 million users. Then you knew you we were onto something. That's cool. Um, Carmageddon. Carmageddon would have been one of my, my milestones that I would have said as well. Um, Carmageddon was um, a 10-mile stretch of the 405 in Los Angeles, the main highway through Los Angeles that was going to be shut down over the course of a weekend, displacing hundreds of thousands of vehicles. So if you're in the uh, very sexy business of traffic, you don't get an opportunity to have something with a cool name like Carmageddon very often, but this was like the you know King Kong of traffic jams, potentially. So. Um, we got a call from, um, from Fox News who said, can you come uh, to LA today? Uh, we would like you to, um, to do a little piece about what you do and we think that crowdsourcing might be the only solution we have to keep track of all these uh, alternate routes. So our PR guy got on a plane one hour later went to LA, did the interview. They ran a three minute piece on us that day um, and that was good on its own. But the more interesting thing that happened was later that night after the piece ran, I got a call from ABC who said, would you like to come be in our studio during the entire time um, and we, we actually got, want you guys to help us report on it and figure out what all this crowdsource stuff is about. So we were like, yeah, of course. So we had about um, two and a half weeks to uh, build the tools, to figure out what we were going to do, fly people from Israel, me and the CEO, all go to LA and basically camp out in ABC studio. So 3 AM, where they're pretending we know how to be traffic reporters. But during that time, we um, realized by working with their team that you could use our iPad app uh, connected to the green screen and that they could actually be doing it themselves, uh, the traffic reporters. And that was pretty cool. But the cooler thing was uh, that they they did probably, I don't know, I want to say something like $2 million of promotion around Waze during that weekend because it was exclusive to them and they wanted to promote that you should tune in there to see what was going on in Carmageddon. On Monday, when the roads reopened, they asked if they could keep using it. So we said yes. Uh, today, we're on over 60 TV stations as a way to report traffic around the world, branded by Waze, our app, and our Waze is up there on the screen. And that was tremendous validation, but more than that, it was a key to our distribution. It drove our growth uh, in early days significantly and um, really became a, a huge validation and growth mechanism. But, but the interesting thing that, that I thought you did, that as a management team that you did there, is that you didn't allow yourselves to become distracted from the core mission. So you, you, yeah. you were able to get the TV coverage, but you didn't become TV stars. I mean, she was a TV star. She had pan makeup and all that stuff. She was on TV, but she was still the same person. They were still executing against the original model, which was map the world with the cell phone, save people time. You never deviated. Yeah. And you didn't allow, the, you didn't become a TV company. You didn't get distracted. You only used it for what was essential to the mission. Why, how did that happen? You know, why were you able to do that? Why did, you, why did that team not get distracted? I think in, in large part it was because we had each other. It's very easy to get distracted in a startup and build all kinds of things that your users, your investors, your team members believe you should build and very hard to say no to those things. Um, particularly in the case of TV, we were offered money uh, to, to be their primary platform for traffic, a lot of money. We were offered by other companies to uh, a lot of money for being a data provider to them. And we said no to all of that as a startup with no revenue at that time because we knew it would distract. You can't build a, a B2B company at the same time that you're building a consumer company. You just can't do, you can barely do one well as a startup. And so it was really hard. Every time we said no, it was painful in some way. Um, but we knew that execution was the number one thing. And if you're going to execute well, you have to focus. So do, do I get to ask a question now, or is it your turn? I know, you go. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay, so you asked me the hard board question, which I was able to deftly maneuver away from. Yeah, I noticed that. If okay. we have time, we can go back. What is the worst thing that happened that you never told your board? 
Oh my gosh. <laughs> Whoa. I'm wow. just warming up. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Worst thing that happened, worst thing that happened, worst thing that happened. Um, do you know that um, I actually quit after three months? I heard for rumor. about 10 minutes. Do you know that? I heard rumor. Yeah. So part of learning to work with Israelis um, means that, and by the way, Noam and John, the CEO and John, are two people I'll work with for the rest of my life. But in the, those formative times, um, uh, Noam can be very, very harsh uh, person. And I think he said something, and it was already, remember, as John just said, I'm going from being the CEO, running my own show, to all of a sudden being like, oh, I have a boss, and it's great. And, uh, um, and he said something about a little girl. You're acting like a little girl. And I was like, you, some curse words. I quit, and I walked out. <laughs> and... Um, and he followed me, and we had hours of conversation. His wife called me that night and was like, my husband is such an idiot. I am so sorry. I cannot believe this. Uh, um, we worked it out. Hey, this yeah. isn't on the internet or anything, is it? <laughs> Everything's uh, on the internet. Okay. Yeah. All right. This is turning into a therapy session. <laughs> okay. All right. You want to go oh, yeah, or yeah, do yeah, I, yeah. I have no, many no, no, more? I, no, no. Okay. Ah, what did you learn from ways that you think you want to apply to other companies? Well, um... That's, there's so many good lessons, and you learn. I, have a, I don't want to give away my question to you. So, with ways, I'll stick to ways. Um, I, I think that I was really amazed at the ability for the company to retain and delight users while we really weren't doing enough for them. So, we were just barely having a functional map, and yet we were able to use game mechanics to get people to actually stay and use the service. And that was kind of a shock. Um, being a very much an A-type myself, I don't really want to waste time. And I couldn't believe that people were using the app to gobble up digital goodies and that we're able to manipulate <laughs> users. I considered that to be extremely lucky, that we were able to delight users. We had a, a, a Yossi's talk earlier was, was great. Um, you know, we had truly one of the, one of the most brilliant UI design people that I've ever worked with. And, you know, she and the team kind of came up with tricks that entertain people beyond our functionality. And so I, I think that was, um, to me, the most amazing thing. That was cool. I mean, just to extrapolate in terms of one of the principles that I think we learned as well from that is this idea of reality checks. So you come up with this product that you think is going to be great. Um, in our case, it relied on, on the crowd. Now, what happens when you don't have a crowd? Well, we would have had a really, really, really bad navigation application at that time. So what we did was... Um, we built an experience that was honest about not having a lot of users. So if you were the first one to go down a road, your icon would turn into a little Pac-Man guy, and you would get, uh, get points for driving down that road. And then we moved on to road goodies, and we would put those road goodies where we didn't have fresh information. And people would drive uh, to the area where the road goodies were, and that would mean that we would get real-time traffic information in those areas. So our head of product was incredibly smart about that. Uh, um, but that reality check kept us focused on, all right, where is the product right now? And are we able to engage people in that reality as opposed to what we wish we were going to be when we had the crowd? Um, so that was, yeah, also, I think that was good. That was a good one. This is my turn now or your turn? I think it's, you go. Oh, good. I like this. Um, okay, so now you're acquired by Google and everything's just perfect. <laughs> and you're now just part of this giant company. Um, how many times have you wanted to quit since you were acquired by Google? Twice. Why? Um, so, okay, what happens when you go through an acquisition is that you, um, you go into this period that I call the acquisition hangover. And the acquisition hangover means you actually can't think. You think you're thinking, but you're not. All you're really doing is reading the news and reading Twitter and seeing what people say about you and if you like it or not. And you're thinking like, shit, do I have money now? Should, should I, what should I be doing with it? You're thinking, um, well, uh, what should we be doing next for the company? Should we be changing something that we're doing in the company? What does this mean? And, and you're just, you have all these questions. And so what happens is you like, can't do anything, even though you think you're moving. You're on autopilot. 
So um, during acquisition hangover, um, it was kind of a confusing time. And then right after that, we actually moved into the Mountain View offices. And that was hard. Um, it's not hard now, I will say. I'm actually having a blast at Google. Uh, but those first two months after we moved in to their offices, which was just August of last year, were very difficult because that's when you do the bulk of your uh, indoctrination. And that happens with um, lawyers and finance people and process and buy-in. Uh, and then I had a tremendous amount of fear that that was going to be life. Uh, and you know, we woke up one day and it wasn't life. We learned the way that we were supposed to work within Google, but at the same time, we kept m almost all of our autonomy in terms of the product, the engineering, our go-to-market, um, everything about how we're building ways, uh, now that we've learned the systems, is completely ours again. And, and I have a tremendous amount of confidence now. It's what, we're going for what I call ways speed in Google scale. And most of us have never worked for a big company before, so I think learning how to scale something to a billion users is a pretty great way to become a better entrepreneur. Um, but yeah, it was mostly around that, that period of time where it was still that, that hangover period. Yeah, that, does that answer your question? Yeah, pretty okay. much. Yeah, I can't go into details about anything that happens at the big G. Okay, yeah. no one's following us yeah. around. <laughs> it's not on the internet. Um, okay, uh, exits. Exits are bittersweet for the investors, especially the good ones, right? So do you ever think, I should just start my own company? I'm going to give up this investor business and have my own thing. Where are you on that? Yeah, I honestly probably think about that uh, every day. Um, but then, you know, the, the addictive thing about being in venture capital is that, in early stage anyways, is that you get to participate in a lot of different um, lives. Every company is different. And so that's pretty addictive uh, to actually be able to experience that. Um, so the trade-off is, is that you're not, um, you're not the person on the front line. And if you've come from an operating background, a lot of people that come from an operating background actually have a hard time in venture because you have to let go and you have to realize that you're, it's really not about you. It's about the people that you've backed. And so you have to help them th indirectly. And that actually takes a lot, of, it takes a long time to actually get reasonably good at that. But the benefit of that is that you get to experience, uh, you know, a lot more than any, than any one entrepreneur in their, in their mission because you get to focus. So on one hand, you get that focus, and sometimes that's very attractive. And on the other hand, you get to look at a lot of different things or be scattered, and that's yeah. also very attractive. So I, I, clearly it's a trade-off, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm content. Who was or is your favorite startup? <laughs> That's like, who's your favorite kid? Um, so uh, I'll get to the answer. So I used to always tell um, for the investors here, um, you know, there's these rare moments. Uh, Yossi said something earlier, which I thought was great. He said a lot of things, which I got a great chuckle out of. But, you know, he spoke about being lucky. And I think that, you know, there you have to have a sense of humbleness in this business. Too many people don't. Um, when you see things going in your direction, it happens so rarely that uh, you have to seize those moments. And they, they literally are few and far between. And so when those things happen, if you've seen it before, you recognize it, and you, you, have, to, you have to strike when all the gates are open. And so those moments are um, transformative. And you always remember those moments. And so clearly Waze is definitely uh, is one. I've had, been lucky to have some others. The one company that always reminded me of Waze was actually PayPal because very different businesses. But suddenly there was a tipping point and we were starting to, you know, people were starting to talk about you independent of the value that you had created. There was a momentum that you could actually mm -hmm. sense. So I used to always say that to the to the founders, and they would always tease me about that, which is why Diane asked me. Uh, and they thought, they accused me of saying that to everybody, but I literally had never met another company that reminded me of, the, of as much of one of the other as those two companies. I will honestly say, it's on the internet, it has to be ways. And the reason is, is that... I didn't know he was going to say that. I wanted yeah. him to, but I didn't know. Okay. And the reason is, is maybe it's more a demographic thing, is that... Uh, because the management team, we actually had at least four ex-CEOs 
roughly, um, being led by a fantastic leader. Um, so the quality of the discussion, not that the quality wasn't great in a lot of other companies, and certainly not at PayPal, but it was so much more mature than some of the conversations you have in this business. And so you're dealing with people who in their domain are very expert. They've kind of, they've led in businesses before. And so the absoluteness based upon experience plus raw intelligence was very unique in this company. So I have to say this was really a blast and it was really hard for me that you uh, decided to sell the company. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Okay, I'm gonna ask a question. Yeah. All right, serious question. All right, so um, you've, had, you've been a many time entrepreneur. You're much more recognized in Silicon Valley than I'll ever be. <laughs> so, um, but you've had success, but you've also had your share of failure. Hmm. And um, really for the benefit of entrepreneurs here in particular, you know, what did you learn more from? And you know, hmm. what are the, you know, what, how do you advise an entrepreneur here to look at the potential for failure? Because you know, the odds are stacked against them. And so how should they think about failure relative to the success you have today? Yeah. First of all, I'd like to say I like success better. Let's just, <laughs> let's just start there. Um, but the reality is, if I didn't learn some way, in my case it was the hard way, the lessons I learned, I never could have added value to ways. Right? Let's face it. Whether you succeed or fail, um, it's a constant process of learning and education. And I swear, I've talked to every other person at Waze as well. We feel like we've used in this company every experience we've ever had. Um, we don't feel like anything was, was left over or, or unutilized. It took everything we ever learned and had. Um, and so the failures, and I had quite a few, um, were a critical part of that because there's no faster way to learn than through doing. Um, and you know, success, failure, as long as you're learning. I think one of the specific things I learned, though, was very much related to the saying no. I, uh, I tend to be a pleaser. Uh, I, 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 if I'm hearing too many things, if I, if I identify something I know needs to be done, it's hard for me to say, I'll do it in a year. I'll do it in six months. That's very difficult. And through working with this team, I think that's one of the things I didn't do well when I was younger in the less successful startups than I did now. So definitely the saying no is a big one. That and this reality check thing that I mentioned earlier as well. I'm an incredibly optimistic person, which means I can always find the good story and whatever's happening at the company. And I actually needed help figuring out what were the things that really were broken that needed to be fixed at the same time. So those are two things I had to learn through failure that I could apply at Waze. Great, uh, that's a fantastic point. So when most companies, um, when they do better, when they finally break through, it's really not about all the things that they can do. It's the things that they learn to focus on and the things they, they learn to say no to. Yep, absolutely. And you guys did it. Part of that was just um, having a team that was well-rounded and actually having the foresight to add people who complement each other but were not the same. It was such an awesome team. It is such an awesome team in that we all have so much respect for each other. I mean, you said it that we were all CEOs before for, for most of us. Um, and so we had so much respect for each other going into it and all very different skill sets that we never said, oh, I can do it better. So we really didn't get in each other's way, but we, stayed, we really helped each other, I feel. There's a video I want to show okay. that is um, about what Waze is up to next. And, um, and it's something that is related to um, after the acquisition, what are we working on? What do we think we can do at scale? And you know, our mission has always been the, the same, save people time every day. But you guys may have heard me talk before about what do you do when you can take that to a much bigger scale, which is the scale of an entire city level? Um, how can you look at taking person by person uh, the ability to, um, to change our mobility? to go from crowdsourcing to what I call mass participation. Um, and this means the potential to be used for um, Hurricane Sandy to the typhoon in the Philippines and really being great at figuring out how to get to a bigger level of crowdsourcing. So I have a, a video to show about Rio, what we're doing in Rio at the city level. I thought they might like to see. And then I have a kind of an ending question for you after that that is much more about four years from now. Okay. Okay, can we show the video?
Same mission, next step. All right, one last question for you, and then we're going to take some questions from you guys as well. OK, um, so we had a unicorn exit. Um, WhatsApp, no one can stop talking about the WhatsApp exit. I want to just for a second, Jan has gotten a lot of flack for not staying independent. But what I've noticed is there's, when you get to a certain size, you have to change your company structure. You don't get to stay fun and focused on the product. You either go public, which is terrible. You have to have people dealing with SEC regulators. You have to do all of that. Then you've got the acquiring companies, the big tech companies, that made it so appealing for Jan, not just financially, but a board seat for Jan means real influence and real autonomy for WhatsApp, right? And so if you think about, oh, I'm still going to go for my users, I'm going to go for my product, what happens now? Where does the next generation of independent companies come from when it's actually more appealing to sell than to go public? Uh, good, hard question. Thank you. Um, I think that... It's very, difficult, it's very difficult to create a company of substance, regardless of whether you're public or private. Um, so those things don't happen very often, right? Um, and there's trade-offs, whether you're public or you're acquired. It's, I don't see that much of a difference in Jan's world. The only difference really is what's going to, it's not really now, it's what's going to happen in four years. So when you sell a company, as you go through that hangover period you talked about, and everybody always talks about you're gonna, we're gonna keep the company independent, but you actually have to prove that and do it over time. Um, as the acquirer starts to integrate, the integration gets uh, more and more pronounced. And so it remains to be seen whether they're actually gonna be independent. For every, uh, that's, that's the one in a thousand, maybe one in 10,000 where they actually follow through and do that. Um, but that said, I think the thing that Mark Zuckerberg deserves a lot of credit for is the, I think, and I don't think the press picked up on it enough, is actually the board seat. You know, yeah. for, for a young CEO, um, chronologically, uh, but a very important CEO to give, you know, give a, a seat and a voice on a relatively small board uh, to an, another entrepreneur, I think that shows a level of maturity and a level of buy-in. And so I actually look at this deal a little differently in that the metrics actually make sense. It looks to me more like a merger it's just that in terms of the way that they've put it together, and it makes sense because uh, WhatsApp actually adds a lot. It almost doubles Facebook's footprint, and it actually adds a new business model that makes sense globally. You know, an ad-based business in emerging markets did not make sense, and, or it was going to be challenged. You're, you're not, they were not going to be able to keep the margins over time. And I think that the business model that they picked up and the commitment to not going to an ad-based model shows a lot of vision and a, a good commonality between the two. So I actually think it, this is a rare deal. Um, I don't know that you could, I, I, I'm struggling to actually think of a precedent to it um, in recent memory. Yeah, me too. Sorry guys. Unfortunately, uh, the Mark Zuckerberg uh, speech is gonna be on, uh, the keynote's gonna be on here at six. Uh, Really sorry for the time here, okay, uh, no problem, Diane. No very, very sorry, John, yes. uh, that you're not able to take the questions from the from the audience. Unfortunately, we're running out of time on this. No problem. Thank you, Thank everybody. You.